Hey, hey, everybody, Z Garcia here, and today we're going to be traveling to the 1940s to become LAPD homicide detectives and solve some murders in Detective City of Angels. <laughs> This game has a few different modes in it, but the classic mode is going to pit a few detectives against each other, hot on the lead of a new crime, in order to solve it first, to get that answer to the who done it. One player is going to be playing the chisel, as the game calls it, and that player is going to be sort of running the game, uh, taking care of uh, answering the detective's questions when they pose a question to one of the suspects in play, uh, things like that. Basically, uh, they're going to act as a game master for all of the detectives at the table. As I said, there are multiple modes. There's a cooperative mode, there's a solitaire mode, but I'm going to be focusing on that classic mode of the game. So, let's go ahead and go to the table, take a look at the game. I will not be giving you any spoilers for the game past the setup for the very first scenario, which is actually an introductory scenario. It's a little shorter, a little simpler, meant to teach you how to play. So let's take a look at that, and I'll see you on the other side. So here I'm going to be showing you the introductory scenario to the game. This one teaches you how to play. It's a little shorter than the usual scenario, and it is called Blood on the Pier. And again, I'm not going to be spoiling anything for you. I'm just going to be showing you the setup. I will not be showing you anything past the setup here that has any implications on the case. Uh, at first, all the players are going to read the uh, introduction to the, to the scenario, uh, to the case here that sets up uh, what happened, uh, who the victim is, and any key players in the game. And once that's done, which I've done already here, then we've got some cards up here revealed, some characters in place. So we know that Sally Foot, card A over here, and that goes into that spot there. All the cards have a letter on the back that lets you know where you set them up first face down. And as you are reading, some of them are revealed. You'll discover the rest of them later. She was the victim. She was shot in the back down here at Horseshoe Pier. So we put that there. That's the scene of the crime. We know that uh, these three characters here, the DiCaprio brothers and Charlie Muggs, are uh, somehow possibly involved, and we know where two of these characters are. We do not know where D. DiCaprio is, so his standee begins on the card up here. And each player is going to have four action tokens, one solve token that they will cash in at the beginning of one of their upcoming rounds to try to solve the case, and some scratch, i.e. some money, okay? They've also got a couple of snitch tokens there, and they begin with their figure, their miniature, outside of play for right now. Normally, the uh, number of days uh, would be uh, based on the number of players. So, for example, for, for cases, normal cases, unless otherwise specified, with three players, uh, we would begin uh, here at eight days. But for this introductory scenario, it's a little shorter, so six days we've got until the case goes cold down there and then you are ready to begin. Uh, one player is going to be playing the part of the chisel, and that player is going to have their own book right here that has all the answers to what's going on, and it has a grid of questions and answers. I'm not going to show you, but it tells you the setup also. That story is in here, and it shows you uh, the solution, what you are looking for, who did it, with what weapon, and the motive. And it's usually those three things are what you're looking for in any given case. Every player is going to have one of these books here, the detective uh, case book, and that also has the setup uh, scenario. It tells you what happened and uh, what it is you are trying to discover. So there you go. Uh, that player who is playing the chisel also has this small board. They have one influence from each player. One, uh, They can use this later on to block questioning, things like that. And they have a few cards here that have information for the players. And again, this player kind of acts as a uh, as a, a DM, if you would, right? They are running the game for all of the detectives who are competing against each other to discover uh, the answer to the uh, to the case here. The uh, mode we are playing right now is called the standard classic mode. There is a way for players to work cooperatively. There's also a way for you to play solitaire where the game itself gives you the uh, answers 
when you prompt somebody for a question and you flip through a large book that has a bunch of entries in it and you can discover what the character would respond back to you. But this is the normal setup, the standard game. Each player on their turn is going to take four actions. That's what the four action cubes are for. And they are going to, before the, uh, their very first turn, place their figure at one of the police stations around the city, which are these locations that have the blue badge there. So at the beginning of the game, I might put my character there at Long Beach and then take my four actions. And then it'll be the next player's turn back and forth once both of them have gone. Then the day passes and we go to the next day, they get their four actions back. The actions are as follows. They can move. That's the first thing they can do. So if you put a cube here on move, you are allowed to move. The way movement works in this game is you can go from one location to a different location in the same section of uh, town. And they are denoted by these glowing lines around the city. So if I am here on Long Beach, and I want to get to, let's say, uh, I want to get over here to Union Station, 47 on the board. For one move, I can go to some location that straddles the line. And then for another move, since I am now both in uh, South Bay and in uh, Central LA, for another move, I could then go to Union Station. So you can get anywhere on the board with, if I am here and I want to go all the way here, I can get there with one, two straddling the line, three moves. That's true for every location on the map. So that's the first one is move. The second option there is questioning someone. And if I am with somebody, I can question them. I'm sharing a location. I'm going to question them about something. This is a good moment to show you that every player has one of these sheets. And it shows you up here the cards. You'll write this all down as the cards are revealed or if you gain new information. And then over here, these suspects, these characters that are in play. So, uh, if I later on, I'm sharing a location with uh, Muggs over here, Charlie Muggs, and I want to ask him about card uh, D, so I want to ask him about uh, D DiCaprio, then I will ask the, uh, the Chisel, the player running that, uh, that part of the game, uh, that combination. So I want to ask Charlie Muggs about D. And that player is going to grab these square cards. They have a selection of answers. They're going to grab this little card display thing. And they're going to slide one of these square cards here. Quick flash, that's what they look like. Don't look too hard. Uh, they're going to slide that in there and give it to the player who's asking. And they are going to read the part that's showing at the top there. So they'll read that, uh, that answer and uh, might be useful, might be not useful. We'll come back to questioning in just a second, okay? And a couple of things players can do with that. Next up, you can search a location. If you are somewhere that's relevant, for example, maybe I'll go to the Horseshoe Pier and search there. And this player, again, has a small deck of cards that talk about searching. There's uh, one in here for every relevant location and one that simply says you found nothing. That one's for everywhere else. You can also search a suspect. So again, Charlie Muggs, I'm sharing a location with him. I search him, and there might be a card on here for Charlie Muggs. And uh, I can then, the other two options there at the bottom are for making scratch. You can analyze, which means you take your time, you think about the case, you make one scratch. Or you can do a kickback, where you are going to make more money, but you have to be somewhere specific, and it's only once per round, okay? So those are, again, to make some money. The money is going to be used for a few different uh, possibilities you've got up here. So I said I would be coming back to questioning and I'm gonna go ahead and do that now because it's really the meat of the game. That's how you find information. You search for some of it, you discover a few things, but you're going to have to question people, which is a big part of the game and a big part of what the chisel is doing is providing answers. Now there's one for every question possibly posed. There is a what the game calls a most useful response. That does not mean it's always helpful, but it is the best they got. And uh, the player who is the chisel may provide you that answer when you pose a question right away, or maybe they'll give you something that's not as useful, and you're trying to suss out what's what. That's a big part of the game. So, whenever you are questioning someone, again, let's go back to our scenario. I'm asking Charlie Muggs about uh, D. DiCaprio here. The uh, first thing that happens is the player... If they have influence over Charlie Muggs because they caught them lying earlier, 
that would denote having uh, one of your uh, cool fedora pieces here sitting underneath him, they could cash that in to force him to give a most useful response. They're muscling him. Okay? Uh, if that's not done, then uh, the chisel might, if they have influence over the detective, use that to block the questioning. Let's assume none of that happens. Well, then the other players are going to get a chance to snitch. So if uh, the yellow player there is uh, asking the question, this player is allowed to pick one of these tokens and possibly snitch. You are picking one, and one says bribe, one says pass on it. If you choose to bribe, you'll put that face down. Again, we don't know which one you picked. And then the player who is playing the chisel picks the answer, lets that player read it. That player may at that point push the uh, the person they're asking because they think they're, uh, you know, being uh, fed a line. If they choose to do so and the player indeed did not give him the most useful response, they will then take back the card, give them the most useful response, and they gain uh, some influence over that character. If they already had the most useful response, then instead they are going to take one of these and put it over here on their player board for the chisel, and now they can block a line of questioning later. So that's how that works. Once that's done, the, the uh, player asking the questions got an answer, then we reveal the snitch tokens. And anyone who actually snitched is going to get to see that answer as well. But you have to pay for that. You have to pay three scratch in order to snitch. So uh, you might you know, bluff and not do it. You might want to listen to this line of questioning. It might be information you already know and don't care. There's a lot of possibilities there. Besides snitching, which is one of the options up here, which costs you, as I said, three scratch, there are three other possibilities up there. The top one there is goon. What that means is when the chisel blocks a line of question, you can pay a thug to basically rough them up and they're going to have to answer the question anyway. That's going to cost you to scratch. You can also, uh, sometimes in the game, players are going to get to see some of these cards and they have a little symbol that says, keep this card. Don't leave it on the board. Instead, pocket this information. And if that's the case, then let's say the blue player, for example, got to see card F and it's some clue to the case and it says to keep it. Then we are going to take this card, that player is going to keep that card, it's secret to them, and we are going to put a card up here that says evidence removed by this player. We mark that that player has removed that card, and we are going to take a matching token, this is letter F, so we are going to find a little token that says F and place it three days down from now on this track on the side of the board. When the day marker finally gets there, that card is going to be turned into evidence. And so people can at that point get information on what that was. But for a few days, that player's got a line of questioning that's possible to them that nobody knows about. And by the way, these spaces down here, you can also use them to track who knows what. So if I know what this card is, I have information on it, I could put a token there, even if the card stays. Again, you don't pull and keep every card out here. You are uh, possibly instructed to do that. So that's how that works, but the other two options up here on top of the player's boards have to do with looking at things that other players know. So, uh, let's say uh, the blue player here has information about card E again. Well, I could um, pay the detective. I have to be uh, uh, with them, and I'm going to pay them to scratch and find out information that they know. And at that point then, I'm with them. I would take my token, I would look at this card, and now I also have information. If every player knows, you can just flip the card over, of course. And then the other option is, uh, you can go to a police station and just get the information from an officer there. It's going to cost you a little more, three scratch, you have to be at a police station, but you don't give them the money. Instead, the money goes out of the game. So you have to decide which one you want to do. You might be giving them too much money, which in, in turn gives them the power to snitch on your lines of questioning. So those are the four special abilities up here. Goon, to, to see a question that's been blocked. Snitch, to listen in. And then detective an officer, to find out something somebody else knows in the game. 
As the days are ticking down, the players are going to find more and more information. You are going to reveal more of these cards up here. You are going to have access to new lines of questioning. If I now know about E, I could, sharing a space with uh, Charlie Muggs, uh, ask the uh, chisel. I want to ask Charlie Muggs about E. You don't say what's on the card, you just say the letter. In case somebody doesn't know what the card is, they will not find out. And only you get to read that question, right? Uh, so that's important. Uh, and, uh, you know, you are starting to put your case together. As I said, you're trying to find out who did it, murder weapon, and then the reason why they did it. And in fact, they give you a word bank in the game as to the possibilities uh, that a player might have done it. So, for example, if I look at my uh, chisel book here, on the back, they give you a summary of questioning, uh, the steps for how that works, but there's also a bank of uh, reasons as to why it might have been done. Jealousy, uh, it's drug-related, it's mob-related, things like that. And once you are ready to solve the case, you are going to, at the beginning of your turn, tell the chisel, okay, I'm solving the case. You grab your sheet of paper here that's going to be covered in some notes, and you write down who did it, the suspect, murder weapon, and the motive down here. You give them that. If you're right, you win the game. Game's over, and then we read an epilogue. If you are wrong, the chisel is going to tell you how many of the three things are right, but not which ones. And you probably are not going to win unless... Th nobody gets it by the time this uh, finishes up, and so at the end of their last uh, day there, there is a final guess for everybody. So it's possible you'll get to guess twice. And in fact, if once you hit the first uh, day there, the, the last day of investigation, if you still haven't used your solve token, then you might as well use it right then and there, because at the end of that very day, you'll get a final guess as well. And that's how the game works. You are, again, muscling people, questioning people, trying to decipher when you are uh, being fed the truth and when you are being lied to, trying to decipher how much a character knows about something, deciding, and this is very important, when you are going to push somebody for a more useful response and when you are going to back off so that you don't give the chisel influence over you to block you later, that is all going to come together with these cards up here to tell you a story, a murder story, and uh, and hopefully you'll be the one to solve the whodunit of the game. So there you go. I'm hoping that gives you a good overview of how the game works, the general flow. The turns are quick. You got four cubes. You take four actions. Next player, they take their four. Uh, if you're only playing with three, two of them and a chisel, then next day, you know, it ticks on down. Uh, if some evidence needs to, turn, needs to be turned back in, then we're going to make that available. And that's it. You're moving around very quickly, questioning people, searching places. Pretty straightforward stuff. And you are going to be taking some notes along the way, of course. You are going to get several cases in the box. There are this many. In fact, uh, let's see. You've got all of these are different cases in the box. And they are ranked by difficulty. So gumshoe being very easy then veteran, and then hard-boiled being the hardest ones. But I think this is a good stopping point. I, I hope that all makes sense, a general flow and, and the competition between the players and the, uh, the way the chisel is going to try to you know manipulate and uh, distract the players, but also tell them a good story and an interesting mystery along the way. So let's go back up top. Let me give you some final thoughts on this game. All right, there it is. That's Detective City of Angels. And I have to tell you folks right away, this is an unbelievable game. It's a fantastic experience and it is produced so lovingly that I was blown away by it. I think it is a truly rich experience. So let's go ahead and dive into it. I'm going to just run you down the list of what I thought here and throw in a couple of uh, you know observations. So we're starting with thematic ties, the theme, what's going on in the game, Does it uh, is it captivating, do the things make sense? And I think they do. The game is completely immersive. It is so rich in theme and thematic ties, and yet it's so playable. This is the kind of experience that 
if not handled just right, can get lost in just solving a puzzle and the game becomes a little shapeless, right? We've had some of those games where, uh, you know, the, the flow, that whole on your turn, you do four actions, then you pass, then you do this, gets muddied. And this one manages to have a real fine structure to turns while still being immersive. And I, I really like that about it. I also think that the theme here permeates every little thing in the box. The artwork all over the place, the language that they use, the actions that the players can take, it all feeds the same thing, and that is telling a rich story. So big thumbs up here. Aesthetics, I was just talking about this. There's amazing artwork on everything. It is a stunning looking game. That Vincent Dutrade artwork does not go to waste in this game, and I love it. Uh, the iconography, when they do use it, is very clean, it's very usable again. Uh, there are little reminders of rules everywhere, backs of books, and everybody has their own, and the, you know, everything is just designed to help you have a good time. And I think that is often uh, forgotten about, you know, or not given priority. And in this game, you can tell this was very much thought through. Replayability. Uh, there are eight cases in the game. I'm not counting the introductory one. If you do, then there's nine. And that's fine. You should. I mean, if you do, you will play that. It's a little shorter, but it'll set up the scenario and it will uh, teach you how to play the game. So eight's not bad. Uh, there is an, an expansion for it as, as well that's out there if you don't find the replayability uh, as, uh, you know, if you, if you burn through it, basically. It scales well with the different modes of play. Solitaire game in this is great. Playing cooperatively, you can do that. You can, there's a lot of different things you can do. You will miss some of the aspects. If you play solitaire, for example, there's no scratch, there is no bribing, there's no uh, taking away information from the other players. None of that will be a part of the game, but the mode works really well. Game length. The pace here is on point. I uh, like the flow of information, the new new uh, information, new questions that arise because of that, new combinations of things, uh, new characters that pop up. All of that stuff is really neat, and it keeps the game flowing. The uh, time pressure will be apparent immediately, but also you'll be getting new information immediately. You're going to be finding things out left and right. You're going to feel like you're finding out as much as you are missing information, you know, I like that a lot. And then contending with those decisions of, am I being told the truth? And also, it's not just, is this the most useful thing that they can say, but is it useful to me? It will always be the truth. It might just not be useful, right? I mean, once you push somebody and they give you the most useful response. And that's interesting to me. I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get to strategy here. Uh, the ease of play. The only thing you got to make sure you're doing is that the chisel player, whoever's playing that part, needs to review the case ahead of time. They need to make sure they know what it is going in. And from that point of view, this, as I said, very much feels like a role-playing game. In some aspects, you know, you have a game master who is going to be running a few players through a scenario. Now, you can choose to go, you know, in guns blazing, try to make it as hard for them as possible. But it's great to be able to, you know, uh, give, uh, uh, you know, manage the group. Like, this player's really on top of it. They know exactly what they're doing. I'm going to th try to throw them off the scent of what the answer is. Whereas this player over here is not doing so well, maybe I'll go a little easier on them. I might block their questions, but not theirs right now. Or when this person asks a question, I can also spend one uh, uh, leverage to force that player to not snitch. You can do that too. So there's that. It, and it's it feels very much like a cooperative, not it's not cooperative, but it feels like a, a role-playing experience that one player is running for others who are all trying to win on their own. Again, classic mode. Lastly, tactics, strategy, luck, things like that. It's very strategic because you want to follow lines of questions. You're also reacting to what other players are doing. So there are, there are a lot of tactics there. But it just feels amazing to discover new things in the game. Um, my favorite thing about it is probably the fact that 
This is not one of those deduction or detective style games in which once you find the puzzle, they spoon feed it to you. There's a big red, you know, uh, box that says, so-and-so did it. No, you still need to solve the puzzle mostly on your own. And you'll be able to tell, you know, who you think is lying, why they might have done it. Uh, what's going on? That must be the murder weapon there. They found these, you know, shells, casings, you know, at the scene. So it must be that good. All of those things work really well together, but they still expect you to be a detective to a degree. And I like that a lot. I think that's a, that's a great balance between giving you information and still wanting you to actually piece it together. So... A fantastic combo there. Overall, as you can tell, I am gushing about the game because I think it is a brilliant design. I love the look. I love the immersion here. I, I like the theme a lot. I think it's a cool world to live in. Uh, I've heard some people say this is like L.A. Noir, the video game in board game form, and that is a very apt description if you are familiar with that video game. So, bottom line for me. A completely engrossing experience that strikes the perfect balance between solving a puzzle, keeping the pace up, and having a role-playing session. This is going to get a 9.5 out of 10 from me, so clearly it's going to get a seal of excellence, and I thoroughly recommend it. Get the game, play it. If you find you've burned through all the cases, there is an expansion out uh, that you can pick up. It has a few more cases in there. You can play that. And hopefully there's more content for it coming so that, you know, this uh, system will stay uh, active and engaging for a long time. So, Detective City of Angels, 9.5 out of 10 from me. Two thumbs way up. Uh, I definitely recommend it. So, there you go, everybody. That's it. I am Z Garcia. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast, or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.